We live in what has been called an age of anger. You may have noticed. Almost every day, perhaps every day, it's nearly impossible to not encounter outrage somewhere. Somebody is angry about something, and chances are they've talked about it, either to you in your place of business, to you in your place of work, maybe amongst colleagues, to you in a the world on social media. Social media even seems to cultivate this outrage culture, doesn't it? Rarely do we see posts on social media that are framed positively or celebratory get a lot of attention. Which ones get shared the most or thumbs up? Is that a verb? Thumbs up? It is now. The most. The angry stuff, right? The people who study these sorts of things understand that complaints get more energy online than compliments or kindness. And the artificial intelligence that curates the stuff you see on your devices understands the conflict gets more energy and response and engagement than anything else. And so it presents you constantly with the things that are intended to provoke outrage. There's some science behind this. The people who take a look at these things and study uh, understand that we're, we're wired for self-preservation, aren't we? That doesn't seem like you need a study to figure that out. Like we're, we, we want to preserve ourselves, and so when we perceive threats, we engage, don't we? Kind of stand up and maybe, maybe get ready to respond. Like if someone is offering you kindness or peace, you don't have to defend yourself. But if you feel threatened, if your identity feels threatened, if, if your party feels threatened, or if your church feels threatened, or if your workplace feels threatened, or your, if your family feels threatened, you bow up, don't you? You get ready, you engage, you prepare, and oftentimes you respond. And so the algorithms that surround us and the engineers who write them and the media producers, the content creators who fill our world with every form of clickbait, understand that the best clickbait is the outrage clickbait. More discouragingly <laughs> is that that amount of content doubles on an annual basis according to some calculations. So just one year later, twice as much outrage as before. Two years after that, four years after that, you have an exponential increase in outrage. And that's one of the reasons we find ourselves in this outrage culture, this age of anger. Well, social media may not have been around in the first century when Jesus was born. But there were people who experienced anger then too, weren't there? There was outrage. There was polarization. There were certain people who got those looks whenever they showed up in town. And in the midst of that world, a world marked by significant conflict, we'll talk about some of it in a few minutes. You got some hints about it in our text that we read today. In a world marked by significant conflict, Jesus shows up and Jesus is heralded. And the thing that is said when he is born, it's something that comes up again and again and again in the New Testament. We just looked at a couple of passages in our reading this morning, but there are dozens is this vocation he comes as one who brings peace. We call him the Prince of Peace. We sing songs at this season about peace on earth, goodwill to all. 
And I can't help but think <laughs> and ask, given our outrage culture, what does it look like for the church to take her own songs and scriptures seriously? To take our own Savior seriously as the Prince of Peace, the peacemaker. Because the reality is, a world filled with outrage needs a church known for peace. Doesn't it? I mean, if there are forces, invisible forces, technological forces, and creators, and media, billion dollar media companies, bent on provoking outrage, do we understand that that is fundamentally antithetical to the gospel? and to Jesus, and to what He calls His people to be, and what He calls His people to do. A world filled with outrage desperately needs a church known by peace. So we get some shepherds. We get some angels. And it's helpful to know that the life of a shepherd is not one marked by kind of consistent favor or peacefulness. These guys are out in a field at night because when you smell bad and look filthy, <laughs> it's kind of hard to fit into polite society, isn't it? So they lived on the fringes. And when they did have to wander into town, covered in who knows what, you can imagine the looks they got and the whispers that people whispered. And maybe the out loud outrage that they would dare to show up in this part of town or at this event or this function. And it's to those guys, people who were not allowed to testify in court because society had a general skepticism toward them. Like, we don't want to hear what you have to say because we don't trust you. We're going to take a disfavorable posture towards you. We're going to be outraged at your presence and silent. cancel culture for shepherds. How about that? Just don't talk. We don't want to hear. Just go outside the city in the fields and make sure the lions don't eat the sheep, okay? And if that's the way the world treats you, like your life is marked by this general angst, and you're just an outsider. And the first word to characterize your life is probably not the word peace. So it's stunning to me that when the announcement of the birth of Jesus is made by the heavenly host, they address those guys and call them as witnesses to the birth of Christ. People no one trusted are entrusted with the message of the birth of Jesus from the start. Can you imagine what it was like for Mary, maybe, right? <laughs> Having just had a baby, to have these dirty guys show up. And I can't help but think as well, like, like we have such style, we miss this because we have these stylized, idealized visions of shepherds. Either like five year olds in bathrobes with towels on their faces and two big flip-flops or something in the nativity plays, or the little nativity things we have where they're sitting there making those strange poses that no one in real life actually makes. Right? That's what we think of when we think of shepherds, but if you really want to think of, like, like, go smell yourself after you've been on the farm for 12 hours. Amen? <laughs> and so it's those guys. The angels come up and they say, Hey, good news, the peacemaker is coming. And he's here. And you go. I know people aren't going to want to see you coming down the road. When you go wandering into Bethlehem, people will hold their noses. Look away. Cross the street to avoid you. But the peacemaker is here. The peacemaker. It's no accident that from the start, when Jesus' birth is declared, that he is said to be the one 
who brings peace to the earth. Glory to God in the highest, the angels said. And on earth, peace among those whom he favors. You get this image, and the image is filled out as the New Testament goes on, that he's gathering his favors, his favorites, his favored people. And the very fact that this is pronounced to society's unfavorables indicates to us that this goes way bigger than we might have thought. Like you make your list of favorable people. The angels come along and say, we're going to add some shepherds to that list. And some people you wouldn't typically add to that list. Because... The church that this Messiah is going to build, the church that this Messiah is going to create, the family he's going to create is going to be filled with former outcasts, former unfavorables. He's going to cast his net wide and he's going to deploy his people to the ends of the earth and no one, no one is outside the reach of his grace and his mercy. And his call. He doesn't bring his call to the expected elite, the religious class, the political power players. He goes to those whose lives are not marked by peace. Because if you're going to bring peace to a world marked by outrage, that's where you start. It's just where you start. Now, the New Testament picks up this theme, carries it forward. As I said, there are lots and lots and lots of texts, but there's a very specific one that we can look at a little more carefully in Ephesians 2. Ephesians, written by Paul the Apostle. And this guy lives his life on the fault lines of one of the most severe conflicts the world has ever known. Jews and everyone else. Jews and Gentiles. And these two groups did not get along. They had slurs for one another. They criticized one another. The Jews were straight up oppressed by non-Jewish government. Their land was occupied. They were slaves in their own cities. When they traveled abroad, some of them tried to hide the fact that they were Jewish. When they competed athletically, in the ancient world you competed unclothed. When you competed athletically, everybody's running around naked playing sports. And some of the Jews would even try to remove the mark of circumcision so they wouldn't be ostracized in Olympic Games. I'm not going to explain how they did that, but there's some scholarly literature on it if you're interested. Jews consistently referred to Gentiles not merely as Gentiles, but Gentile sinners, dogs, and any other number of slurs. The Gentiles just knocked the Jews around for fair for fun. Jews that cooperated with the, with the Gentiles provoked its own sort of outrage in their community. Traitors, treacherous, treason. So the Apostle Paul decides, well, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I'm going to go plant churches all over the Roman Empire filled with Jews and Gentiles. <laughs> that sounds like a plant. Talk about an uphill battle. I mean, talk about ambition. Talk about a guy who everyone else would think that's crazy because Nowhere else in the world, nowhere else in society, do you get these two groups of people together in, in, in peace. And Paul says, yeah, I know, that's the point. That's the point. 
because a world filled with outrage. So let's go find the biggest stinking fault line the world knows and preach the gospel. And that's what he does. And he specifically applies that to this conflict setting in this text. Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, I'm addressing you Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles, like called the uncircumcision. And that, if you're Jew, is not a compliment. It's a criticism. Remember that you were, at that time, without Christ, being aliens in the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Paul's not much of a PR guy, is he? <laughs> Hopeless outsiders. That's who you are. That's what he says to them. He says, however, now, verse 13, but now things have changed, circumstances are different. In Christ Jesus, you once were far off and you've been brought near now by him, by his blood. And then he says this in verse 14, for he is our peace. Jesus. Born of Mary, worshipped by shepherds, heralded by angels, Messiah, Son of David, Son of God, He is our peace. And so Paul says, hey listen, I know this is the ultimate fault line. I know that the outrage goes both ways, back and forth, across this fault line, and we don't even have Facebook to make it worse. Jesus is our peace. In His flesh, He has made both groups, Jews on the one hand, Gentiles on the other, into one. And He has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. That is, brothers and sisters, a direct application of the Gospel. Christ died for our sins. He made us alive. He took our dead spirit self-being and made us alive. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 8. That's the gospel. It's what he does. He regenerates us. He gives us the new birth. All the language we use to talk about conversion and salvation. It's all just dumped right in there together. This is what he does. He came to save us. He was born to save us. He died to save us. And the direct application of that for Paul, this is explicit. He doesn't leave it to our imagination. It's not implied. It's not figure out your own conclusions. It's not a choose your own adventure. It's not just take this great central theme and do whatever you want with it. He says specifically, Jesus did this. He was born of Mary in Bethlehem to take the hostility between Jews on the one hand and everyone else on the other and tear it down. That's why he came. Explicitly, particularly, specifically, unquestionably. Hostility, tear it down. Conflict, tear it down. Self-gratifying anger, Jesus says, I've come to tear it down. Robots that fill our faces and minds and hearts with outrage that has nothing to do with us most of the time, Jesus says, I've come to tear it down. He has abolished the law with its commandments. This is verse 15. That He might create in Himself one new humanity. So you've got this Two sides to the con every conflict's got at least two sides, doesn't it? He says, I'm going to take and I'm going to rescue people from both sides. And your new identity in Christ is going to supersede everything else. Jews don't stop being Jews. Gentiles don't stop being Gentiles. We don't lose our identities when we become Christians. We don't sort of just sort of get rid of every perspective we've ever had. I don't stop. We don't get rid of our lineage. We don't get rid of our heritage. We don't. Some things need to go, obviously, and Jesus deals with that. But the, thing, like, but, 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 but the Jews don't all of a sudden start eating pork because they become Christians. 
we still carry that sense of identity. But the Jesus identity goes to the top and defines everything else. It defines their ethnicity. It defines their party. It defines their sports, their competition, their politics, everything. The Jesus identity defines everything else. Paul says that's what it means for him to make a new humanity out of us. He's given this vocation to his church. And he expects his church to be known for these things. Why? Because the world is filled with outrage, and conflict, and anger, and people, with power, and agendas. We want to chop it up so they can make a buck, or a lot of bucks, and keep their power. Jesus comes, says, I've come to rescue you from that. Because when those attitudes and perspectives, when those postures govern our hearts, and we engage the world like that, like, I'm going to get mine, and I'm going to succeed, and it doesn't matter who gets hurt, or who gets offended, or who gets stepped on. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and it does, that, self, that me, self-centered thing, Jesus says, I've come to tear it down. Come to heal. That's a cancer. It's a disease. It's darkness. It's rebellion. I've come to heal. That's why he was born. That's why he died, and that, brothers and sisters, is why a weary world rejoices when he comes. Because he's come to heal strife. The only people who perpetuate strife are the ones who think they have something to gain. And it never helps any of us. Whether it's in our families, whether it's in our churches, whether it's in countries, whether it's in the world as a whole, whether it comes across the TV, the radio, or a phone, social media platforms, wherever, those who perpetuate strife are always trying to control something. Jesus came to tear that down. And it's not just him. He expects his brothers and sisters to pick up the vocation. He doesn't save us just so we can kind of have this spiritual condition that's generally unrelated to everything else in our lives. He saves us so that he can reproduce his character in us. He rescues us, he regenerates us, he gives us the new birth so that he can reproduce his life, his values, his priorities, his agendas, his life, his being in us. And that's why he says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they they will be called children of God. That one hits hard. For a sometimes ill-tempered, red-headed Irish guy. <laughs> you know, because sometimes we get a little energetic. And sometimes we want to kind of, uh, like, get our word in. Sometimes we have a temper, and sometimes we get angry. It's not just the Irish, right? We all have that. <laughs> Jesus says, if you want to be one of the children of my Father, peacemaking is what we do. Call it the family business. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. And I'm thinking, so Jesus, you're saying, like, if I don't embrace that vocation, like, my children of God status isn't, like, guaranteed or 
in question or like what's going on? And Jesus says, listen, O'Reilly, I've come to heal you. Set you free from those things. It's not really about status. It's not really about qualifying. The question is whether I'm your Lord. And whether my character is increasingly embodied in your life. And I'm the son of God. And I've come to do the will of my father. I've come to make peace. I've come to tear down the wall of hostility, not build it up. And if my character is being reproduced in your life, if you're one of my brothers or one of my sisters, you're going to join me in that vocation. That's what's going on. <laughs> this is the vocation of the family of God. In a world filled with outrage, the children of God are known for peace. So we're asking, how do we do that? Like, how do we push back against the artificial intelligence that is working 24-7 to, to cultivate, cultivate outrage? How do we push back against the billions and billions and billions of dollars that are spent to cultivate outrage? How do we, how do we even begin to push back? What does it look like? And friends, it looks like Christians in our homes and in our Sunday school classes and in our churches, simply embracing the peacemaker vocation. It comes first by recognizing that Jesus has come to make peace. First, peace between us and God. So my first question is, has Jesus made peace between me and God? Has He reconciled me? Has He forgiven me? Have I confessed that I'm far from you and I, I, I want to be drawn near and, and that that's the work of the Holy Spirit convicting me and converting me and bringing me in? And the reality is, when we gather, some of us may not even be there yet. And if the Spirit of God is convicting you, saying, you know, maybe you're a little not quite as close to me as you thought you were and, and I want to make peace between you and the Father, and like, don't resist that. He's at work. Surrender. Let him be the peacemaker in your life today. And then recognize that if he does that, when he does that, he wants to reproduce that in your family, in your life, in your family, in your circles that you run in, in your workplaces. So what does it look like? For me to say, all right, Jesus has welcomed me. He has made peace between me and his Father. That's why he died. Now, where are the places in my life where I have influence to embody that? Where are the conflicts? They don't have to be like headline conflicts. I start with my kids. How do we make our home a place where we are all, five of us, not just mom and dad, working for peace? It starts with mom and dad. <laughs> it's easy for mom and dad to rip the peace apart at times, isn't it, for all of us? But how do we embody peace and raise children who embody that sort of peace? Gospel peace, not some sort of fake, like, just don't bring your problems to the table so we can pretend everything's nice and fine. But let's hash it out. Let's be peacemakers. That doesn't mean we ignore problems. It means we name them and we get reconciled. So what will it look like for parents to say, I want to raise my children so that Jesus can say to them, blessed are you, peacemakers. Welcome to the family of God. Some translations on the Beatitudes translated happy are the Fill in the blank. Happy are the peacemakers.
This is what it looks like to be free from strife and free from the pain of conflict and outrage. Like nobody who's outraged is happy. Jesus says, I can offer you fulfillment, blessedness, happiness, joy. This is what it looks like. So is my family a place that looks like that? You seek peace with God. You seek peace with others. Start with your family, then go to your other groups. Like get a piece of paper and write them down. My golfing buddies, my hunting buddies, my sewing club, my book club, my whatever, my seed group, my band group. Sorry, my band group. We were seed groups in another church I served years ago. Um, <laughs> my band group. Like how do I cultivate these things? And is there a place in my life where me and somebody else have had words? And we haven't had words since we had words. <laughs> that probably ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of us, doesn't it? Colleague or somebody at school, or whatever. If I'm going to be a peacemaker, is Jesus calling me to do the unthinkable? To swallow my pride? And to pick up the phone and say, hey, I know I said those things. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Knowing that it may not be received. You may not even answer the phone. You may get hung up on. Whatever. But if Jesus is calling me to do that, then my faithfulness doesn't depend on, depend on the other person's response. So maybe there's somebody in my family or somebody in the church or somebody somewhere else, and there's estrangement, and there's pain, and there's anger, and there's hostility, and there's outrage. And every voice around me, except the voice of the gospel, says, hold on to your anger. And Jesus says, I've come to set you free, to tear it down end the hostility. Brothers and sisters, if you've ever been in this place, you know how hard it is. And it is only attainable, accessible, accomplishable by the grace and presence and kindness of the Spirit of God. To say I was wrong first especially when I'm not the only one who was wrong, <laughs> is one of the hardest things in the world any of us will ever do. Our vocal cords really aren't trained for it, are they? <laughs> but that's where the things that make for peace start. And yeah, you're not going to see an instant change in the world out there. The corporations and the platforms and the content, the clickbait, it's still going to be there. But your life will change, and your family will change, and your relationships will change. And the outrage out there won't have the same impact that it once did in here. And let me say this, that's why Jesus came. That's why he came. And the more believers who do that, the more the church that Jesus came to save will be a place known for peace. And over time, may take a thousand years, <laughs> may take more, eventually, the forces of outrage will falter. And the reign of the Prince of Peace will be realized. And those words we sing every Christmas, joy to the world, will be on the lips of all who love them. I wonder how well we envision a day 
in the reign of the Prince of Peace becomes our visible experiential reality. The reality is every choice I make every day either works toward that or walks away from it. We just have to decide what sort of Christians we want to be.